Okay, we're on chapter 18 now. It's uh, problem number 7. It's on page 619. And we have uh, five resistors that are connected in this particular manner. So we have one resistor which is then connected to three resistors that are in parallel. And then they come over here to a common point and then go through another one like that. And they all have the same resistance value, R. So the answer is not going to be a numerical number. It's going to be some fraction of R or some something to do with R, some number in front of R. Now, resistors are exactly the opposite of capacitors as far as what the relationships are when you have parallel and um, series. And one way you can think about it is that resistors are like valves in water, in a water system. And so if I have the, the flow restricted by a certain amount in these three lines, the amount of flow through the valve is dependent upon the, the pressure difference between the two sides. And so it's not dependent, these guys are not dependent upon each other. They're only dependent upon what the one is next to it, not what is the pressure difference across it, okay, which is the same for all three of them. So you get three times as much flow when you have resistors in parallel, and therefore the resistance is going to be one-third in that case. So when you're in parallel, let's just write down the words, when you're in parallel, the equivalent resistance to the resistors in parallel, you can replace that with one resistor, which is going to be equal to the sum of the reciprocals of the resistors. And then you can put as many as those in as you want. Now, when you have a series, they are dependent upon each other because if you have a total voltage drop across all the way across here, you have to break that up into individual drops, which have to be, so it's not, you don't, the flow is going to be even less the more, the more of these you put in. And so the resistance is going to be greater. So for series resistors, you just add the resistors together to get the equivalent resistance. So all we have to do in this problem is, is recognize that we have here some resistors in parallel which will then create one resistor, which then will have three resistors in series. So the first thing to do is to rewrite these three as an equivalent resistance. So we'll call that equivalent resistance one. Um, so we're go what we're going to do is we're going to replace this circuit by this. So the middle three resistors are going to be replaced by an equivalent resistance. We'll call that R E Q one, and then we'll have R here, and we'll have R there. And the equivalent resistance for those three resistors in parallel, we get by using the reciprocal relationship. So we'll have it one over R plus one over R plus one over R. And in this case, what you end up with is you'll end up with three divided by R on the right-hand side, because you have 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. So you get 3 over R is equal to 1 over the equivalent resistance, RQ, REQ1. If you take the reciprocal, you get the answer. So we see that the equivalent resistance 1 is just R divided by 3. And that's what we said was going to be less than. The resistance is less if you have three of them in parallel than if you have just one by itself. There's three places the flow can go through, and therefore the flow is going to be higher. Okay, so now what we have is we have these three resistors. Actually, we have two real resistors and one equivalent resistor. So the two real resistors will have resistance of R, and the middle resistor will have a equivalent resistance will be R over 3. And then now that we have these three in series, we just add them together. So we'll call REQ2 is just going to be R plus R over 3 plus R. And so this is 
going to be three thirds plus one third plus three thirds, at least six, seven thirds. So the seven thirds R is the equivalent resistance for this original circuit. So we can replace those five resistors with one resistor, which will have a resistance of seven thirds R. So let's just stop for a second, check the answers. Okay, so there we go, that's good. That's the right answer. So again, resistances in parallel use this relationship. Resistors in series, you use this relationship. When you're simplifying these types of combinations of resistors, you first take the parallel parts and reduce them down to the single equivalent resistance. Then, so you do that for all the parallel parts. Then if you have a series group, then you can then reduce that series into also one equivalent resistance. Okay, we're going to uh, do problem number 11 on page 619. And it says the resistance between terminals A and B in figure 1811 is 75 ohms. So if you measure the resistance between these two with a ohm meter, which is the same as a multimeter, you would measure 75 ohms. And it consists of five resistors, three of which are known and two which are unknown, but they have the same value. And so this is what the equivalent circuit would look like to a multimeter, is it just read 75 ohms. So what is the question is, what does this resistance have to be here and here so that the equivalent resistance of the circuit is 75 ohms? So really what you have to do is just have to take this circuit, which consists of elements that are in parallel, I mean in series and in parallel, and reduce it down to a final expression that's a function of these three resistors and this resistance. And then you'll end up solving the equation, which probably will be maybe a quadratic equation or something like that. <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure at this point. So let's go ahead and start. So we can't use these in parallel yet because these we have, you have to have just a single resistors in parallel. So we have to first convert this into an equivalent resistance. <clears throat> so let's call that R, REQ1. So the, this equivalent resistance for these two together would be REQ1. Okay. And they're in series, so that means they're added together. So we'll say R EQ1 is going to be R plus 5. Okay, now we'll have these three resistors in parallel, 120 ohms, 40 ohms, and this equivalent resistance. And so let's call that R EQ2. And how do we find that? Well, because these three resistors are in parallel, we have to use the reciprocal relationships. So we'll say 1 over REQ2 is equal to 1 over 120 plus 1 over 40 plus 1 over the quantity R plus 5. Okay, so that's that. Now, um, what will happen then is we will, so this, what, what will we have at this point? We would have the resistance R, and then we would have an equivalent resistance for the three resistors in parallel. So this is going to be the circuit at this point. This is going to be R, E, Q, 2, and this will be R. And then these two combined together will give us 75 ohms. So what we can do is we can find a common denominator for um, the right the right hand side because we need to solve for REQ two. So uh, we'd have forty. The common denominator would be forty times R plus five, and that's because this has a factor of three. Uh, actually, we'd have to 
we'd have 120 years. Let's see that. And the reason we don't have to do 40 is because 40 times 3 is 120. So we'd end up with 1 from this fraction, 1 1 20th, plus uh, we'd have 3 1 20th, which would be 1 40th. And uh, I just realized I made a mistake here. So this one we're going to have to multiply by r plus 5 in the numerator and the denominator. So we have r plus 5. Okay. Now here we're going to have plus 3 times r plus 5. We need the r plus 5 because it's not in the denominator. And we need, another, we need a factor of 3 as well to get this into the same units. So you can see what's happening is if I take r plus 5 divided by r plus 5, I'll have 1 over 120, which is this term. The second term, 3 divided by 120 is 140th, and those cancel out. Okay, the final one, we need to multiply by 120 times 1 to get this in the same common denominator as the final answer. So what we have is multiplied out in group-like terms. So we'll have r plus 5 plus 3r plus 15 plus 120 all over 120 times r plus 5. And in group-like terms, so we'll have 4r and we'll have 5 plus 15 is is 20 plus 120 is 140. And if I really have a common factor of 4 here, we could divide it out. I think that would work. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. So if we divide by 4 in both the numerator and the denominator, you're going to get r plus if you take 140 divided by 4, you'll get 35. And you divide by 4 in the denominator, which would give us 30. 120 divided by 4 is 30 times r plus 5. So, okay. So now we can say that the equivalent resistance to, we just take the reciprocal. So we'll have 30 times r plus 5 divided by r plus 35. So I'll just switch the numerator and the denominator. Okay, so now all we have to do is to find the final equivalent resistance. These two, the remaining resistor, which we haven't taken into account yet, and this REQ2 are in series, so those are added together. So we say it's R plus REQ2, which we just calculated to be 30 times r plus 5 divided by r plus 35. Okay, so we know that the equivalent resistance that is being measured is 75 ohms. And now that the rest of it is just is just the algebra part. So let's see what would we do. Um, probably what I would do is I would take 75 minus R. So I'm going to subtract R from both sides. And then I will cross multiply. So I just take the numerator times the denominator, numerator times the denominator. Here we have a, uh, it's going to be using FOIL. So we'll have 75R multiply first. Enter, you've got uh, minus r squared. And then outer is going to be 75 times 35, which is 75 times 35 is 2,625. So, and that'll be positive, plus 2,625. And then we have last, which is negative 35r. And that's equal to the right-hand side now, which is this times that. So it's just 30 times 30R plus 150. Okay, so we're going to make a quadratic equation out of this thing. 
So we'll end up with negative r squared from this part. We have 75 minus 35 is 40. And then we'll subtract 30 when we get that on the other side. So we'll have plus 10r. I think that's right. 75 minus 35 is sorry, 40. Yeah, 40. Positive 40. We'll subtract 30. When this is subtracted from both sides, we'll get 10r. And then we have 2625 minus 150. And that's going to be positive. 2475 is equal to 0. And I'm just going to change the sign and everything. OK. So now the question is, is there an easy way of doing this, or do we just use the quadratic formula? And I think I'm just going to use the quadratic formula. So we know that r is going to be minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And so if we plug that in, we'll have minus a minus 10 plus, we we'll take the positive square root because negative is probably not going to be a positive resistance. So b squared, so I have negative 10 squared minus 4ac all over 2a. OK, so we'll have 10 plus. So what do we get? We get 100. 10 squared is 100. So now we're looking at in here. Negative 10 squared is 100. And we have a negative times a negative. So we'll have plus 4 times 2475. And we take that to the, to the 0.5 power, and we get 100 divided by 2. So that's 110 divided by 2, which is 55. So we get 55 ohms. OK, so let's, uh, let me just pause for a second, check out the answer. OK, so I've looked at the answer, and that is correct. So um, and you can see if we had had a negative square root, that would have been negative 100. And it would have been the negative resistance, which is physically impossible. So um, let's kind of review what we did. Let's go back to the beginning. We start out with this circuit. Three known resistors, two unknown resistors, both of the same value. We knew that the multimeter was measuring 75 ohms. So we know that, we know that the equivalent resistance of these resistors had to be 75 ohms. So we had to reduce this circuit down to an equivalent resistance in terms of these three known and these two unknown resistances. So first thing we did is we combined these two resistors that are in series. And we added the resistances together. OK, so that was the equivalent resistance for those two. So now we could substitute that in. We can now use this equivalent resistance. Now we have three resistors in parallel. And this is the relationship you use for resistors in parallel. So the equivalent resistance of the three resistors in parallel are 1 over the equivalent resistance is equal to 1 over 120 plus 1 over 40 plus 1 over the equivalent resistance of these two. And then we found a common denominator, multiplied things out, combined like terms, divided by 4 and built the numerator and the denominator, and then took the reciprocal to find the equivalent resistance for, this, for these four resistors. And then we took this resistor plus this resistor in series. Um, where was it? Yeah. So now we took these two resistors in series, which is where you add the resistors. So we knew that the final equivalent resistance is going to be R plus REQ2, which was this. We knew that this was measured to be 75 ohms. So we subtracted R from both sides. Then I created this uh, two proportions, two ratios, so that I could just cross multiply. 
So I take this times that, and if you do that, you end up with this left-hand side. So I'm using FOIL when I multiply these two together. The right-hand side is 30R plus 150. Okay, then we moved everything to the left-hand side and combined like terms and got all the science straight. And then we said, okay, do we know how to factor that? Well, um, I'm trying to think if there's any way that we could have factored that without having to use the quadratic formula. It probably wouldn't have been easy. If you think about it, you know, the difference between the two numbers in the factor, or the summation of the two have to be equal to negative 10. So uh, if you take the square root of like 2,500, it's 50. So it's probably going to be around 50 is going to be the magnitude of the, one of the, the roots, probably a little bit larger, a little bit smaller. And so you might have been able to guess. But I just used the quadratic formula to solve for the resistances. And I just plug the numbers in, and I used the positive square root, knowing that there's only one real answer to this. There's not two real answers. One's going to be, um, not it's going to be imaginary, but it's not going to be physically, it doesn't make physics that physical sense. So I used the positive square root and ignored the negative square root. And I ended up getting 55 ohms. And then I said, OK, yeah, well, if I use the negative square root, I would get a negative resistance, which is physically impossible. OK, this is problem 13. And it's uh, fairly complicated as far as uh, solving it. But we will work through it. And hopefully, you'll understand it at some point. So we have a battery. And so this battery would cause current to flow through these resistors. And the question is, um, find the current in the 12 ohm resistor. So they're asking for the current in this particular resistor. So how the heck do you solve something like this? Well, what you have to do is you have to basically reduce all these resistors down to an equivalent resistance. And then you use that equivalent resistance to find how much current is flowing in here. Then you'll use that current in this resistor to find out the, the voltage drop across here. So then we know that the rest of the voltage drop has to go all the way across here. So you use that voltage drop and the equivalent resistance of these resistors to find the current. And then with the current and this resistor, you can figure out the voltage drop across here. So we know the voltage drop across there. And once we put another voltage drop across there, we can calculate the current. So it's, it's kind of a convoluted, it's not convoluted, but it's, it's fairly complicated in that we go all the way down to reduce all these to one resistor. And then we have to go backwards in a backwards direction to solve for the unknowns. And you could solve for every current and every voltage and every resistor doing it that way. They're only asking us for the current in the uh, 10 ohm resistor. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit here, and then I'm using the figures from the solution just so they look a little nicer than I would do them. So let's just think about how we would reduce these resistors. <laughs> well, what we're going to do is these two are in parallel, so we'll, we'll combine those two into a single resistor here. These two are in parallel, and we'll combine those two into a single resistor. Then we'll have two resistors here in series, and we'll combine those into a single resistor. And then we'll combine these two, this and this one, and the equivalent resistance into a single resistor. Then we'll have two resistors in parallel, which we'll then combine into a single resistor. And then we'll have this plus that equivalent resistance in series, and then we'll be able to combine those into an equivalent resistor, and then we'll get the final answer. So we have to do about five steps to get to the end here. So let's uh, let's show this. So what we're going to do is we're replacing this resistor here with an equivalent resistor, and this one with an equivalent resistor. Now resistors in parallel use the reciprocal. So let's call this uh, R sub EQ1, and we'll call this R sub EQ. That's for equivalent, or EQ2. So the equivalent resistance 1, well, because it's in parallel, since these two here are in parallel, we use the reciprocal relationship. So we'll have 1 over the equivalent resistance is 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6. OK, so that we're using those two right there. 
which is going to be 2 over 6. And if you take the reciprocal of both sides, you get 6 over 2, which is 3. So the equivalent resistance here is 3 ohms. Likewise, we can do the same thing here for the equivalent resistance 2. Let's say 1 over equivalent resistance 2 is going to be 1 over 12 plus 1 over 4. And then we find a common denominator, which we'd have 1 12 plus 3 12 we multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 3, that will give us 4 twelfths, which is 1 third. If we divide both, both the numerator and the denominator by 4, we get 1 third, and therefore we can take the reciprocal of that, and we find out that it's 3 ohms. Okay, so this one is also 3 ohms. Okay, so that's the first thing we do. Now, the second thing we do is we, we combine these two resistors in series. And when they're in series, you just add them together. So I'm going to just add them 6. 3 plus 3 is 6. And likewise here, 3 plus 2 is 5. Let me just put a decimal point in there. Okay, now, so that was just... 3 plus 3 is 6, 3 plus 2 is 5 for, for series resistors. Now, now we have these two resistors which are in parallel. <laughs> so I'm going to call this, uh, this is going to be called RQEQ3. And because they're in parallel, we have to do the reciprocal relationship, so it's not quite so easy. And so what we have is that is equal to 1 over this, 1 over 6, plus 1 over 5. And if we combine those in the common denominator, we'll have, this will be, well, let's just go ahead, we'll have 5 thirtieths plus 6 thirtieths. I multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 5 and by 6. And now we have the common denominator of 30, so we can add those and you get 11 thirtieths. And so the equivalent resistance 3 is just 30 over 11. Okay, and then the final thing is we combine these two, which are now in parallel, I mean in series, so you just add them together. So we'll have 3 plus 30 elevenths and so let's just write that down, 3 plus 30 elevenths. That's 33 elevenths plus 30 elevenths, which is 63 elevenths ohms. Okay, so that's the first step. All we're going to do is we're going to actually work backwards here. So I'm just going to go from right to left instead of left to right. But before we do, let me just check to make sure that that's the correct answer. Okay, so that is correct. Now we're going to use uh, Ohm's law to calculate information. So we know that the voltage drop across this equivalent resistance is eight resistor is 18 volts. So the current, this current I, is going to be equal to, well, what is it? Current resistance. Yeah. So it's going to be voltage divided by resistance. And the reason I know that is the larger the resistance, the smaller the current. It's just like flow rate. The current is like flow. This is like pressure. So we have 18 volts divided by 63 elevenths ohms. And so we're going to put this in decimal form at this point. 18 divided by 63 times 11, 3.14. So it's 3.14 amps. So if we go back here, then this is still 
one four amps right there. <laughs> okay, now this equivalent resistance is the equivalent of all those things combined. What we're going to do is we're going to find the voltage drop across here based on this current and this this resistance. And then we'll take the difference between 18 volts and this voltage drop to find the voltage drop we can cross there. So let's just do that. So we'll say, let's do it down here. So but let's call this element 1 and this is element 2. So delta V, we'll call it delta V. The delta V across 1 is going to be equal to, and you use the same relationship, is going to be equal to the current times the resistance 1. So we get a current of 3.14 amps times a resistance of 3 ohms times 3, 9.4, 3 volts. So that's delta V1. Therefore, this voltage drop across here, we'll call it delta V2, is just 18 minus 9.43 volts. So 18 minus 9.43 is 8.57. 8.57 volts. Okay. And it kind of makes sense because this is 3 ohms. This is um, a little less than 3 ohms. So you'd expect a little more voltage drop across here than you would across there. So you get 9.43 here and 8.57 there. Okay. So we're going to go back. Now, what happens is that this voltage drop, where we, oh, it went too far. Did it go too far? Yeah, here we go. Okay. We're looking at this lower leg of the, so now we know the voltage drop across here. So we know that's what we know from A to B, A D to B. So if we say the voltage, say, from B to D is 8 point, what do we get, 8.57 volts. So this is 8.57 volts. And then you can apply, again, using Ohm's law to figure out how much current is going in I2. We'll call this I2 using their terminology. We know that I2 is going to be equal to, and again, that's current is voltage divided by resistance. The voltage is the same either leg, so we're just going to look at this lower leg, and um, the voltage is 8.57 volts. The equivalent resistance is 5 ohms, so we get 8.57 divided by 5 ohms, it's 1.71, 1.71 amps. Now, so in this case, I2, we can also, we don't ask for it right now, but I1 could be calculated two ways. We could take the voltage and let's call this R2, we'll call this R1. So you take 8.57 volts divided by 6 ohms. 8.57 divided by 6 is going to be 1.43. If we add those two together, we get 3.14 amps, which is the same as we have here. So. Basically, you have the current going through this one resistor, and the total current has to then split. Some of it goes up here, some of it goes down there. In this case, because <coughs> this has a lower resistance, we get more current through this lower leg, and we get less current through the upper leg. Okay, so now, now we know the current I2. So if we go back to, uh, oh, it keeps going back too far quickly. Okay, so now we know the current through this leg, and it'll go through each one of these resistors. So what we're going to do is we want to find out what the voltage drop across here is. Well, to do that, we need to find the voltage cross drop from E to D. 
So we'll say the voltage drop from E to D is going to be equal to the current times the resistance. So we have I2 times, we'll call that uh, times 2 ohms. 2 ohms. Okay. And I2 was 1.71 amps times 2 ohms. 1.71 times 2, 3.42 volts. That's, so that's from here to here. The total dr voltage drop was 8.57. So if we wanted to find out what the voltage is here, if this, if the total, so the total is 8.57 from our previous step. This much is 3.42 volts. Then this right here has to be the difference, 8.17 minus 3.42. So we get 4.75 volts. Okay, now, this is the equivalent resistance that involves the original 12 volt resistance. So we go, so we go back to the original thing. And now we know that the voltage drop from here to here, that is 4.75 volts. And the voltage drop from here to here is 3.2 volts, which we really don't care about anymore. <coughs> okay, so to find the current through each one of these resistors, the current through the 12 ohm resistor is going to be current is voltage divided by resistance. And so we're going to use the 12 ohm resistor, and the voltage is going to be 4.7 volts. So we 4.75 volts. So we get 4.75 volts divided by 12 ohms, and we get 3.96, 3. or 0.396, and that's amps. You know, ask is, but the current through the 4 ohm resistor is just going to be 4.75 volts. The voltage is the same from here to here, divided by 4 ohms. So we get 4.75 divided by 4. We get 1.18, actually 1.19. amps. If we add those two together, if you take this plus that, you'll end up with the um, current that we had to go back two steps here. So 1.43. So if you go back here and you take 0.396 plus 1.19, I don't get the same answer, so I might have made a mistake. Let me just check the answer, and then I'll come back. Okay, so I, I made a math mistake here. So I've made the correction, so I'm going to go back and explain that to you. Uh, this number was wrong. Uh, I just subtracted it wrong. I'm not sure how I did it, but uh, the total voltage drop from here to here was... 8 point, let's go back here. Total voltage drop was 8.57, 8.57. So I calculated this voltage drop to be 3.42, and if you do the math correctly, you get 5.15 volts for that one. Okay, with that voltage drop, then I can calculate. I calculate, so using 5.15 volts across here, I get a current of 0.43 amps in the lower resistor. And if I do the upper resistor, I get 1.29 amps. And you add those together, and it works out correctly. So, And that's one 
reason that it's sometimes good to kind of do an extra step or to, to try to confirm that what you've done is correct because you find out where you've made mistakes. So, so let's, um, let's kind of review what we did. So we, we started with this complex network of resistors. We combine these two resistors in parallel into an equivalent resistance of three ohms by taking one over six plus one over six and then getting basically one third right here, taking the reciprocal, that gave us an equivalent resistance of three ohms. If we did the same thing here, we end up with an equivalent resistance of three ohms as well. So we have three ohms, three ohms, three ohms, and two ohms. These are now in pair, in series, so we combine those two and these two into resistances of six ohms, three plus three is six, three plus two is five. Then we combine these two, which are now in parallel, into an equivalent resistance using the reciprocal relationship for resistors in parallel, and we came out with 3011. So we could replace these two resistors here with one resistor, which was 3011s. And then finally, we had just the 3 ohm resistor in series with the 30 over 11 resistor ohm resistor, and you just add those together, and you get down to a simple circuit with one resistor and the battery. So from the just knowing the resistance and the voltage, we calculate the current through this equivalent resistance. 3.14 amps. Now the 3.14 amps, if we go back one step, is going to flow through both of these resistors, the real resistor and the equivalent resistance. And you can calculate the voltage drop across each one of those resistors uses, using Ohm's law. So I calculated the voltage drop across this resistor to be 9.43 volts, and because the total has to be 18 volts, I knew this one had to be the difference between 18 and 9.43, which was 8.57 volts. Okay, so we take that voltage and we go back one step, and we say, okay, now we're going to expand it out again. We have 8.57 volts across each one of these equivalent resistances. What is the current through each of them? Well, we, could, we didn't calculate I1. We could have, but we didn't because we weren't asked for any information about the upper one. So to calculate the current through this resist equivalent resistance, all we have to do is we know the voltage drop and we know the equivalent resistance. So we can use Ohm's law to calculate the current, 1.71 amps. And if we did the upper branch, we have the same voltage drop, but the current's different. It turns out to be 1.3 amps. If you add those two together, it's the same as the, the current that goes through the single equivalent resistance. Okay, so now we take this, this current and we have to go back one step. So that we have now this current flowing through these two resistors. Same current. So since we have the current going through the two resistors, we can calculate the voltage drop across each resistor. So this one has a, has a resistance of, and yeah, I guess I could have, I didn't really need to do this step. I'm just thinking about it. I could have used the equivalent resistance to find the voltage drop across here. Here I did it by subtraction, I think. Yeah. So the second way of doing this would have just been to take the, the drop between B and E, so let's just write that down here, the voltage drop between B and E, you just use the equivalent resistance, which is 3 ohms, and the current, which is 1.71. So you take 1.71 amps times 3 ohms. 1.71 times 3, you get 5.13 volts. I'm not sure why we're not quite exactly matching up here. 1.71 times 2 is 3.42 plus 5.13 is 8.55. Okay, I'm not sure why that is. It's small enough. I'm not going to worry about it right now. 
OK, so either way, you can take this voltage and subtract it from the 8.57 to get this, or you could just use Ohm's law. So that gives you the voltage drop across this equivalent resistance. Then you use that voltage back one step to this point. Now we know the voltage drop across these two resistors is the same. And we can calculate the current through each one of these resistors by, again, using Ohm's law. So the current through the 12 ohm resistor is the voltage, which is 5.15, 5.13, whichever one's right, uh, divided by the 12 ohm resistance. You get 0.43 amps. The current through the upper resistor is the same voltage drop divided by 4 ohms. Instead of 12 ohms, you get 1.29 amps. So this is the final answer right here, 0.43 amps. Okay, well, we're doing problem 25 in, in um, chapter 18. And this is an example of a problem where you need to use Kirchhoff's laws to solve for the voltage, voltages and currents in this particular circuit. <coughs> and that's because we have two batteries. If we had one battery, we might, we might be able to simplify the, the resistors into one resistor. And then once we have the current flowing through the battery, we could then work backwards like we did in, in problem 15 to find the voltages and currents. But in this case, uh, you just couldn't do that. So we have these Kirchhoff's laws. And there are two laws. One is the current law, excuse me, and one is the loop law, which involves voltages. So we can. Um, <coughs> We have we have two junctions in here. We have a junction here. We have a junction there. But they're basically the same thing because this current will go through this resistor and go to this side. Uh, this current is coming from somewhere. It's coming right through here. And this current would go around. And so there's really only one junction that we need to worry about, which will be this junction. <clears throat> and they've made some assumptions about which direction the current is flowing. And these probably two are pretty reasonably, pretty, pretty good to reasonable expectations. Because this side of the battery is the positive side. And this is the negative side. And this is the positive side and negative side. So typically, you have the positive charges will move in this direction. And so the current would move in that direction. Likewise, the current would move from negative to positive. So it would tend to bring it in. Now the question is, would the current, would I3 go this way, or would it go this way? And it probably goes this way because this is 24 volts and that's 12 volts. But if we guessed wrong, we could uh, change it later. We actually get a negative number here. Now, as far as voltage, you have also have to make some comp. Well, when you choose the currents, you've basically decided which way the voltage drops, because the voltage drops in the direction of current. So what we should have is a voltage drop across here. So I'm putting a positive side on that side. And likewise, we should have a voltage drop across this resistor because of the current flowing through it. Just like if you had water flowing through a pipe, you'd have a pressure drop in the direction of the flow. So all of these, we can kind of put our plus minuses, which are the direction of the voltage. So we're going to have voltage drops from here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here. So it's always from plus to minus. So Kirchhoff's current law. Or I guess we could call it junction rule, maybe. It involves current. So let's just call it the junction rule. I think that's what it's called. It says that, that the sum of the currents into a junction have to equal 0, or um, what goes in must come out kind of thing. So let's do what goes in must come out version. So what's coming into the junction is I1. And that has to equal what's leaving, which is I2 plus I3. Those are the currents. I stands for current. OK, and then we have the loop. We have to, we're going to have to do two loops. So we'll call it Kirchhoff's loop rule. Well, what it says is that the sum of the voltages, voltage drops and rises around a closed circuit 
is equal to zero. So if we're going to have we can we actually have three loops, but we're going to use the two loops here, the upper and the lower loops. So let's call this the upper loop. And we're going to go. It doesn't matter which way you decide. I'm going to go clockwise. I could go counterclockwise. Wouldn't make any difference. Okay, so what do we have? We'll start, let's just arbitrarily put a point right there and start going clockwise. So first thing we do is we have plus 24 volts across the battery. Okay, then we go across the resistor. And what we do is we use, we use um, Ohm's law across the resistors. And what Ohm's law says is, well, let's start up here. Ohm's law it says that the, there's a resistance associated with the element, and it's the ratio of the voltage to the current. So another way of saying that the voltage drop across the resistor is the current times the resistance. <coughs> so that's what we're going to use. We're going to use the current. So what, what is the current flowing through this resistor? Well, it's I1, and it's going from plus to minus, so we're going to have a voltage drop. So it's negative I1 times R, well, let's just put the resistance in there, times the resistance, which in this case is 2. And I'll put ohms in there. OK, so that's first, second. And we have another voltage drop across that resistor. So it's going to be, again, I1 times 4 ohms. Move this over. Gives me a little more room. And then the final resistor around this loop to get back here again is through this resistor. Because the current is assumed to flow in this direction, we again have a voltage drop. So it's going to be minus I3 times 3 ohms. And that has to all equal 0 because we come back to the same point. So that's the upper loop. And then we have the lower loop. So let me put a different dot. Doesn't matter. It has, I'm going to start right here after the battery. And we'll, do, we'll also go clockwise. If we were counterclockwise, all the signs would be different. But because they equal 0, it all, you could just divide by negative 1, and you get back to the same thing. OK, so we have plus 12 volts across this battery. Now, we actually have an increase in voltage across the resistor. That's because the current's flowing this direction. So when we go this way, we have a decrease. When we have this way, we have an increase. So it's going to be plus I3 times the resistance, which is 3 ohms. OK, now we go right, come to this point. Because the current's flowing in this direction, we have voltage drop. So we have negative I2 times the resistance, which is 1 ohm. And again, this final one, to get back to the blue point to go all the way around, we have a voltage drop because the current's going this direction in this part. So we have minus I2 times 5 ohms. And that also equals 0. Now, what we've resulted in here is we have three equations, 1, 2, 3. So let's write that down. Three equations. And we have three unknowns. Three unknowns are the three currents. So let's go ahead and write those down. And what we want to do is we want to write them kind of in this form. We're going to have I1, I2, I3, and then the constants on the other side. So this first equation will be I1 minus 2 I2 minus I3 equals 0. Up here, we'll have, now, if we subtract 24 from both sides, we'll have all negatives. So let's, then we can divide by negative 1. So what we will have is 2 I1 plus from this term plus, OK, we've got two I1s, so we've got two plus four. These are like resistors in series. So we actually, we're going to actually put six, six I1. 
and then we'll have zero I2, so let's put zero I2, plus uh, three I3. I'm taking the ohms off because it's just easier to deal with. And that equals 24, which is this part. Likewise, we can we could uh, subtract this from both sides and then divide by negative one. So these would be end up being positive. So you have one ohm plus five ohms is six ohms, and that's times I two. So we have plus six I two. But this one, when we divide by negative one, become negative. So we'd have negative three I three is equal to twelve. So those are three systems of three linear equations, and uh, <coughs> I was going to think, I think yeah, we don't learn that. We'll teach you in class how to use the uh, inverse on your calculator to make it so you can solve it easier. But we're going to use we're going to use substitution here because what we can do is. If we substitute in here for I2, we'll have as a function of, oh. we should be able to do some kind of back substitution. Uh, let's see. Yeah, because we can solve this one for I2 and plug it in here. We can solve this one for I3 and plug it in there, and then everything will be in terms of I1, and we can solve it. So <clears throat> let's let's do that. So we start with the last equation. And you can see that we actually can divide by 3 to make it easier. So let's take equation number three, divide by three. That'll give us 2i1 minus i3 is equal to four. And let's solve for, what are we going to solve for? i3. Uh, actually, i2. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do here? Actually, I, I2, so we can substitute that, and I1, and we'll substitute the solve for I3. <clears throat> okay, so what we would get is, actually, that's, I wrote that down wrong here. This should be I2. So there's something was wrong. Okay, so it's two, everything divided by three, so we get 2I2 minus I3 plus four. So we solve for I2. Okay, so we have I2 is equal to I3 plus 4 divided by 2. Make sure that's right. That's right? Okay. So, and then we'll take the second equation. We'll solve for I1. Uh, again, we can divide by 3. So let's, let me put a line here. So that's, this is the third equation. <laughs> Okay, so the second equation is going to be equal to, if we divide everything, everything by 3, we'll get 2i1 plus i3 is equal to 8. So we're going to solve for i1, and that's going to be 8 minus i3 divided by 2. Okay, that looks right. Okay, now we're going to substitute both of these into equation one. So for I1, we'll put 8 minus I3 divided by 2. For I2, we'll put in I3 plus 4 over 2. And for I3, we'll just leave it alone. So that everything is now in terms of I3. Uh, let's multiply everything by 2. That will give us 8 minus I3 minus the quantity I3 plus 4 minus 2I3 equals 0. And so we'll have negative I3 from here, we'll have another negative I3, and we'll have negative 2I3 from the third term. So there are, those are the ones involving I's. And then we will have plus 8 
minus 4 plus 8 minus 4 is 0. So we get negative 4i3 is equal to 8. 4 is equal to 4. 8 minus 4 is 4. Yeah, let's, uh, let's make sure we do this right. Okay. 8 minus 4 is 4. So we have plus 4 equals 0. We can divide by 4. So we have negative i3 plus 1 equals 0. Therefore, i3 equals 1. So that's 1 amp. Now all we have to do is back substitution. So let's uh, add a page. Let's write i3 equals 1 amp. So we can plug back in so we know that i1 is equal to 8 minus 1 divided by 2, which would be 7 halves amp. And i2 is going to be 1 plus 4 divided by 5. I'm divided by 2. 1 plus 4 is 5. Okay, so that's 5. 5 halves amp. Amps. So what we should have is, what was our original equation here for, for uh, we had I1 minus, so let's copy that. Oops. I need to group that together. Okay, so that was our original current rule. Let's just confirm that it's right. It, it makes sense. So <clears throat> we'd have I1, which is 7 halves amps, minus I2, which is 5, ha or five halves amps. Minus I3, which is 1 amp, which is 0. So that checks. Okay, so there's no excess current into that loop. Okay, so what was the question? That's, can the circuit shown be reduced to a single resistor? No. Explain. Um, and that's, and the explanation for part A is that you're sharing this resistor. So how do you, you mean you can combine these two and you combine those two, but you've got this third resistor which is shared by these two batteries. So there's really no way that you can do it. So. Calculate each of the unknown currents, I1, O2, I3, for the circuit, which is what we did. Now, if you wanted to calculate the voltages, all you would have to do is use, you would just have to use um, Ohm's law, because we know the current through this is, is uh, well, we, we calculated it's on the other page, so I can't remember what it is, but you know, once we know these currents going through the resistors, we can calculate the voltage drops. So I think I'll actually do that in just a second. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just go to this solution and just make sure that I did it correctly. So uh, this is problem 25. So I get I3 is 1 amp, I2 is 2.5 amps, and I1 is 3.5 amps. So that's what I got. So we got that current done correctly. Now let's just show that the voltage drops here are consistent. And I'm going to write the currents right here. And actually, I'm going to add a page into this. And then we'll, once we know the currents, we'll calculate the voltage drops, and we'll see that it all does work out. So I1, let me go back to the last page here. I1 was 7 halves. I2 was 5 halves. I3 was 1. Those are all amps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually copy this thing over, copy, paste it in. Oh, wrong thing. Put an extra page in. I don't want to do that. Okay, where's the paste? Oh, apparently I'm going to erase the paste. Okay, so copy, paste. Okay, so. <clears throat> I'll, I'll do the voltages in blue. The voltage drop across this, so delta V is just going to be equal to 2 ohms times um, I1, which is 7.5 amps. So what I get is I get 7 volts. 
uh, this resistor is going to be, the voltage drop is going to be 4 ohms times 7.5 amps. And so that gives me 14 volts. Because I've got 4 divided by 2 is 2, 2 times 7 is 14. And then through here, I3 is 1. So the voltage drop across this is going to be the resistance, which is 3, times the current, which is 1. And so it's 3. So if you take 7 plus 14 is 21, plus 3 is 24 volts. So we get a total drop of 24 volts. OK, let's do the next one here. I2 is 5 halves. So the voltage drop across here is the resistance, which is 1 ohm, times the current, which is 5 halves amps. And so we get the voltage drop across that resistor is 5 halves. Likewise here, the voltage is the resistance, which is 5, times the current, which is 5 halves amps. And so we get 25 halves volts across those. So now we add these voltages up. Now this is an increase in voltage. So across this resistor, so I'm writing them down here. So we actually, if we go this direction, we have plus 3 volts. Then we have minus 5 half volts across here. And then we have another negative 25 halves volts. So what does that give us? Let's put it in halves. So we got 6 halves volts minus 5 half volts minus 25 half volts. So 6 minus 5 is plus 1. Plus 1 minus 25 is minus 24. So we get negative 24 halves volts, which is 12 volts, negative 12 volts. So we get a, going around this loop, we have a drop of negative 12 volts, which matches the increase in voltage of 12 volts across the battery. And so the total voltage around the loop is zero. So we get that happening in both cases. And that's generally what happens with Kirchhoff's laws, is, you, is that you end up with as many equations as unknowns. So if I had another loop with another voltage in there, I would do the same thing. I would get one more equation, because there would be one more current. And I'd have four equations and four unknowns. And that gets a little hairy. So in that case, uh, we definitely would want to think about using the calculator and inverse functions. So when, once you guys get through this, we'll talk about an easier way of solving this instead of having to use substitution, which is what we used. OK, we're on chapter 18 now. It's uh, problem number 7. It's on page 619. And we have a five resistors that are connected in this particular manner. So we have one resistor, which is then connected to three resistors that are in parallel. And then we come over here to a common point, and then go through another one like that. And they all have the same resistance value. R. So the answer is not going to be a numerical number. It's going to be some fraction of R or some something to do with R, some number in front of R. Now, resistors are exactly the opposite of capacitors as far as what the relationships are when you have parallel and um, series. And one way you can think about it is that resistors are like valves in water, in a water system. And so if I have the, the flow restricted by a certain amount in these three lines, the amount of flow through the valve is dependent upon the, the pressure difference between the two sides. And so it's not dependent. These guys are not dependent upon each other. They're only dependent upon what the one is next to it, not what is the pressure difference across it, Okay, which is the same for all three of them. So you get three times as much flow when you have resistors in parallel. And therefore, the resistance is going to be one-third in that case. So when you're in parallel, let's just write down the words. When you're in parallel, the equivalent resistance 
to the resistors in parallel, you, you can replace that with one resistor, which is going to be equal to the sum of the reciprocals of the resistors. And then you can put as many as those in as you want. Now, when you have a series, they are dependent upon each other because if you have a total voltage drop across all the way across here, you have to break that up into individual drops, which have to be, so it's not, you don't, the flow is going to be even less the more, the more of these you put in, and so the resistance is going to be greater. So for series resistors, you just add the resistors together to get the equivalent resistance. So all we have to do in this problem is, is recognize that we have here some resistors in parallel, which will then create one resistor, which then will have three resistors in series. So the first thing to do is to rewrite these three as an equivalent resistance. So we'll call that equivalent resistance one. Um, so we're go what we're going to do is we're going to replace this circuit by this. So the middle three resistors are going to be replaced by an equivalent resistance. We'll call that R E Q one, and then we'll have R here, and we'll have R there. And the equivalent resistance for those three resistors in parallel, we get by using the reciprocal relationship. So we'll have it one over R plus one over R plus one over R. And in this case, what you end up with is you'll end up with three divided by R on the right hand side because you have one plus one plus one is three. So you get three over R is equal to one over the equivalent resistance RQ R E Q one. If you take the reciprocal you get the answer. So we see that the equivalent resistance one is just R divided by three. And that's what we said it was going to be less than the resistance is less if you have three of them in parallel than if you have just one by itself. There's three places the flow can go through, and therefore the flow is going to be higher. Okay, so now what we have is we have these three resistors. Actually, we have two real resistors and one equivalent resistor. So the two real resistors will have resistance of R, and the middle resistor will have a equivalent resistance will be R over 3. And then now that we have these three in series, we just add them together. So we'll call REQ2 is just going to be R plus R over 3 plus R. And so this is going to be 3 thirds plus 1 third plus 3 thirds, at least 6, 7 thirds. So at least 7 thirds R is the equivalent resistance for this original circuit. So we can replace those five resistors with one resistor, which will have a resistance of 7 thirds R. So let's just stop for a second and check the answers. OK, so there we go. That's good. That's the right answer. So again, resistances in parallel use this relationship. Resistors in series, you use this relationship. When you're simplifying these types of combinations of resistors, you first take the parallel parts and reduce them down to the single equivalent resistance. Then, so you do that for all the parallel parts. And then if you have a series group, then you can then reduce that series into also one equivalent resistance. So I'm going to do a couple of problems together here, just so I don't have to do many videos. So the, these are the ones I hadn't done earlier. So these are all the power problems. So problem 34, 33 says, suppose you have a waffle iron that's rated at 1.00 watts connect to a voltage source of 120 volts. What current does the waffle iron carry and what is its resistance? So we really have 
two equations we have available to us. One is that the power is equal to the voltage times the current, and Ohm's law, which says that the, that the uh, voltage equals current times resistance. And there are variations of this. If I substitute for V into here, I get P is equal to power is equal to the square of the current times the resistance. So in this case, the first thing they're asking for is what is the current? And so we look at here and see what we have. And we're dealing with power, so we have to go over here. So I'm given the power and I'm given the voltage, so I just have to solve the current. Current is power divided by voltage. And as long as the units of power are watts and the units of voltage are volts, then the units are going to work out correctly and we're going to get a current. So we have 1 divided by 120, which is 0 0.008333. And sometimes we write small things like that as millivolts, so it's going to be 8.3 millivolts because you're going to divide, multiply by 1,000. So if you multiply by 1,000, you'll get 8.3 milliamps, sorry. So these are amps. What's divided by volts is amps. Okay, so that's the first part. And the resistance you go to Ohm's law. I guess theoretically you could use this one, but because you can solve for resistance power divided by current squared, they have both of those, but really I'm going to go back to, um, so resistance is voltage over current by solving for R. So I have 120 volts and I divide by the current, which is 0 0.0083 amps. That's ohms, volts per amp, 120 divided by 0 0.0033. I get 14,400. Seems, that seems kind of big. So what did I do wrong here? Uh, did I do anything wrong? Oh, because it's a kilowatt. <laughs> OK. Which equals 1,000 watts. Sorry. So this should be 1,000. I should have realized when I got down to here that current in a waffle lot plate thing should be a lot bigger. Anyway, you get um, you get 8.33 amps. And then we go over here. Usually resistance is for heating elements or you know in the tens of ohms. So 120 divided by 8.33 is 14.4 ohms. That makes more sense. OK, 34. If electricity costs 12 cents, or 0 0.12 dollars per kilowatt hour, how much does it cost to burn a 100 watt light bulb for 24 hours? So the uh, energy, kilowatt hours is a unit of energy. The basic unit for energy is a joule, but this is the one that we use for uh, electrical power. So to find this energy in kilowatt hours, you take the power, which has units of kilo, if you use kilowatts, and you multiply it by the time which is going to be in the units of hours to get in the right units. That's the energy. So to get the cost, you just take the energy in kilowatt hours and multiply by the cost per kilowatt hour. So in both of these cases, we're going to, for case A, we have 100, we have the power is 100 watts, which we're going to convert to kilowatts by dividing by 1,000. And the time is 24 hours, which is already in the correct units. So our energy is 0. Point kilowatts times 24 hours. And that will give me 2.4 
and the units are kilowatts times hours or kilowatt hours. So to find the cost, we're going to take the dollars per kilowatt hour and multiply by the number of kilowatt hours. So our cost per kilowatt hour is 12 cents or $0.12 dollars per kilowatt hour multiplied by 2.4 kilowatt hours. So we get 0.12 times 2.4. So the cost to run a 60 watt light bulb, was it 60? 100 watt light bulbs for 24 hours is 0 0.288 dollars or 28.8 cents. Now, we probably should just use two significant figures because that's what uh, we have in this problem. So, 29 cents. Okay. Make sure I did everything right here. 100 watts is point one kilowatts times 24 gives me 2.4 kilowatt hours. Okay. So, that's good. Uh, part, part B, operating an electric oven for five hours if it carries a current of 20 amps at 100 and 240 volts. So what we do, in this case, we're not given the power. We have to calculate the power. So the power is the current times the voltage. So the power, in this case, is the current 20 amps times the voltage, which is 220 volts. 20 times 220, 4,400, and the units are watts, or 4.4 kilowatts. So to get the energy, in this case, we take the power times the time. The power is 4.4 kilowatts. Time is five hours. So we get five times 4.4, which is 22, 22 kilowatt hours. And the cost is the um, dollars per kilowatt hour times the number of kilowatt hours. So we have 12 cents or 0.12 dollars per kilowatt hour <coughs> times 22 kilowatt hours. So the cost equals 0.12 times 22, $2.64. So that's 34. What do we got next? 36. We have a high voltage transmission line with a resistance of 0 0.31 ohms per kilometer. The current is 1,000 amps. The line is of the potential of 700 kilovolts, which is 700 times 10 to the third volts, or 7 times 10 to the fifth volts, so 700,000 volts. The city is located, so we have some distance here. Distance equals 160 kilometers. What is the power loss due to the resistance of the line? What fraction of the transmitted power does this loss represent? So one of the questions, I guess, is do we use 160 kilometers or do we, do we use 320 kilometers? And I believe it's 320 because if we draw this circuit, we, we got to go out to the city, and then we got to come back. Let's send a little moment in the cities. 
and smaller just to do the calculation. So we've got 160 kilometers there. We got 160 kilometers back again. Okay. So this is what is the power loss due to the resistance of the line? So the total resistance is going to be the resistance per kilometer times the number of kilometers, which is 320 kilometers. 0 0.31 times 320, 99 ohms. I'm going to pause here just for a second. I was just looking at the solution to see whether they use 160 or 320. It turns out they use um, 160. I'm not sure exactly if I agree with that, but let's just assume it's right. So we have 0.31 ohms per kilometer times 160 kilometers. So that's 49.6 ohms. So we have that the uh, power, the resistance power, is I squared R. And the current is 1,000 amps times 49.6 ohms. So I'm going to square that. Squared. 49.6. Okay. Seemed like a big number. So I was checking my answer. But it's not. So it's uh, five. Let's see how many, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 5.0 times 10 to the 7th watts, which is equal to 50 megawatts. Now, that's the power loss. The actual power transmitted, in this case, is the current times the voltage. And so the current is 1,000 amps times the voltage, which is... 700 kilowatts, 700,000 watts, 700,000 volts. So if I take 1,000 times 700,000, I get 700 megawatts. So if you look at the percentage, you would take 50 divided by 70, 700 times 100%. So 50 divided by 700 is 7.1 percent loss, which is actually kind of still kind of big. Make sure I got that right. Yep. Okay. So that's how you do 36. And 36. We have 30, uh, 38 and 39. So it says power supply to a typical black and white television is 90 watts when the set is connected to 120 volts. How much electrical energy does this set consume in one hour? So you've got watts, so the energy in terms of, um, and I'm assuming they want the kilowatt hours, all you have to do is take the power times time, the power is 90 watts, the time is one hour, so you just get 90, that's 90 watt hours. What we need is then divide by 1,000, so it's 1,000 watts per kilowatt. So we get uh, 90 divided by 1,000, which is 0 0.09, so the energy is 0 0.09 kilowatt hours. 
kilowatt hours. A color television set draws 2.5 amps when connected to 220 volts. So the second part, they give you the current, 2.5 amps, voltage, 120 volts. So the power is current times voltage, 2.5 amps times 220 volts. So that's going to give you watts, 2.5 times 120 is 300. So that's 300 watts, compared to 90 watts, it's actually quite a bit more power. And so the energy, okay, so that, how much time is required for it to consume the same energy as the black and white model consumes in one hour? So we have the energy here. So remember, energy is power divided by, power multiplied by time. So the time it takes is going to be the energy divided by the power. So we're using the same energy as we did here, which was 0 0.09 kilowatt hours. Then we're going to divide by the power, which is 0 0.3 kilowatts. And that'll give you the number of hours. So it should, it should be less time. So I get 0 0.3 hours. And if you multiply that by 60, get 18 minutes. Okay, let me just check the answer since I have the answers open up here. So it's, it's 37. Uh, hmm. Oh, this is 38. I was like, what? 18 minutes. I actually do the uh, the energy in joules. So let's let's go ahead and do that in joules. So how do you convert 0 0.9 kilowatt hours? Which is so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by a thousand watts per kilowatt and three thirty six hundred seconds per hour. And so the units will end up with this um, watts times seconds, which is ends up being joules. So we have 0 0.9 times 1,000 times 3,600. And so the energy in different units in joules is 3.2 times 10 to the 6 joules. Okay, let's check our answer here. 3.2 times 10 to the 5th joules. Did I, what did I do wrong there? Did I just... 0 0.9... Oh, it's 0 0.09. I just copied it wrong from here. 0 0.09, so this is 10 to the 5th instead. 0 0.09 kilowatt hours times 1,000 watts per kilowatt times 3,600 seconds per hour. Watts times seconds is joules because watts are joules per second. And then the final one is 39. What is the required resistance of an immersion heater that will increase the temperature of 1.5 kilograms of water from 10 to 50 degrees C in 10 minutes while operating at 120 volts? Uh, Okay, that actually is something we haven't learned yet. So we'll skip that one for right now. What we can, the way you would solve it is you can, there's a formula that says the energy in heat transfer is equal to the mass times the specific heat times delta T. So our delta T is 40 degrees C. We know that this is for water. It's given. What day? I think it's 4186 kilojoules per kilogram, maybe. And the mass is given, and you multiply all this stuff together, and you get that Q, which is energy. And then you can take that energy and figure out, um, with the time, you can figure out the power. And 
really the power you can uh, you, and with the volt the power and the volts you can calculate the, the current and then you can calculate the resistance so that's kind of the way it works but like I said we haven't covered that because we skipped over that in the interests of trying to, to do more of the uh, Arduino stuff Okay, this is problem number 40 in chapter 18, and it's on page 622, and we have three particular appliances in a kitchen, and we have a coffee maker, which is ra rotated, uh, rotated, rated at 1,200 watts. We have a toaster, which is rated at... 1100 watts and we have a waffle maker so these are all things that put out a lot of power <clears throat> a lot of heat so the waffle maker is 1400 watts it says the three appliances are connected in parallel to a common 120 volt household circuit so the voltage is 120 volts and so these are all power <clears throat> and if you remember that the power is just equal to the voltage times the current. And so what we have, it says they're in parallel, so we can kind of represent them, or uh, you know, represent is a good word, I guess, as resistors. They're all resistive elements that are making heat in one form or another. And they're parallel, so they're all connected to the same voltage. The voltage across each one is 120 volts. The question is, what is the current? Well, <clears throat> all we have to do is um, we can uh, use the power and the voltage to calculate the current. And then you just add up the current. It's like flow of water through three pipes. So you just get the flow through each pipe and you add it up, and that's the total that has to come in and go out. So it says, what is the current in each appliance? So we just apply this expression for power and we solve for the current. So the current is equal to power divided by voltage. And as long as the voltage is in volts, <coughs> the power is in watts, the current will come out in amps because a watt is, well, a watt is actually a, is a joule per second, but the units work out. So, so if, let's, let's say I sub C is the current for the coffee maker is 1,200 watts divided by 120 volts, and that comes out to be 10 amps. The current for the toaster is 1,100 watts divided by the same voltage because they're in parallel. <coughs> and it's going to be a little bit less. So I get my calculator out here. So 1,100 divided by 120 is 9.5. One seven amps, and the current through the waffle maker is fourteen hundred watts divided by one hundred and twenty volts, and that's eleven point six, eleven point seven, I guess actually, eleven point seven amps. <coughs> So the total current is just going to be the sum of the three currents, 10 plus 9.17 plus 11.7. So we get 10 plus 9 points, let's round it off to 9.2, plus 11.7. Then we get 30.9 amps. <clears throat> you could have done that by just adding, if you wanted the total current, you could just add the total wattage and divide by 120. Okay, so that's it. That's the total. That's parts A and B. Is a 15 amp circuit breaker sufficient in this situation? And <clears throat> so what we would have is if you had a 15 amp circuit breaker, it would cause this thing to trip. Uh, and, you know, what are you trying to protect? Are you trying to protect the waffle maker and the coffee maker? <clears throat> or are you trying to protect the wires in the wall? So you're actually trying to protect the wires in the wall. You could actually you could only actually run one of these at a time. 
And I'm just going to pull up the solution <clears throat> and see what they say. Uh, it says, no, the total current required exceeds the limits of the circuit breaker, so they cannot be operated simultaneously. In fact, with a 15 amp limit, no two of these appliances could be operated at the same time without tripping the breaker. <clears throat> so a 15 amp circuit breaker is not sufficient to have all the units working simultaneously. But then again, if, if the 15 amp circuit breaker is in there to protect the wires on the wall, then the issue is that <clears throat> either you need to uh, increase the diameter of the wires in the wall so that you can increase the current without overheating the wires. So it's, it's kind of a, it depends how the question is asked.